Good morning to, one, to each and every one of you once again as we're staying through one of the most awesome books of the whole entire Bible, the book of Revelation. And this week we're going to be studying chapter 13, so if you want to be opening your Bibles there, we're going to be studying all 18 verses, and there are something, some lessons that we will glean from this chapter. As we learned from last week, we learned that Satan had lost his power and had been cast down to the spiritual realm. So therefore, Satan must do something in order to persecute the church. And so what does he decide to do? Well, he decides to gather up some allies besides himself to, to go full force against the church of Jesus Christ. And so that's what this chapter 13 is all about. And there are two groups that Satan gets himself to be an ally. He gets the land beast and the sea beast. And we're going to see what those represent in a description of them. So as we, as we always do, we're going to look at the imagery of this, these beasts, and then we'll look at some impressions that should be made upon our minds. So the Bible says, I stood on the sand of the sea. Now, this verse under consideration is, uh, some, verses, some translations have a different rendering, and I believe that they have a better rendering because they go back to the older manuscripts. And the NRSV says this, and they have chapter 12, verse 18, saying, Then the dragon took his stand on the sand of the seashore. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. And on its horns were ten diadems, and on its head were blasphemous names. Other versions, of course, talk about John was standing on the, on the sand of the seashore. Well, of course, I don't think there's too much a big deal here, but I think what you can see here is that the NRSV is trying to give us the meaning that the dragon stands on the sand of the sea and says, come forth and fight with me so we can gather against the church and fight against it. So I think it has a lot more meaning to it, if you want to put it that way. So the application is, of course, that Satan wants to gather as many people, as many allies as he possibly can to fight against the God of the universe. And of course, really, you know, God is all powerful and he cannot be defeated. But nevertheless, Satan wants to try. And so Satan wants us as his allies. He wants us to be a friend of the world so that we will be made an enemy of God. And so he wants you. He doesn't want God to rule over your life. He wants to rule over you, though. And so we need to be very careful. Are we letting Satan rule our lives? Because as Jesus would say, he who gathers not with me is against me. As you can see, some of the allies of Satan on here, we're not going to go through all of them. But as you can see, there's so many allies of Satan out there that many people appeal to these false philosophies and some of these dangerous isms that we have covered thus far. Such as, I mean, if we think about Calvinism, Islam, Hinduism, denominationalism, humanism, you can look at all these. And sadly, many people appeal to a lot of these in their daily lives. We can think of some as also the, the emerging church movement going on today. We think about the liberalism, sadly, where people don't want to follow God and his laws. So you can see how many forces, evil forces there are out there. But we're to put on the arm of God, stand as soldiers of Christ, and fight against the Satan. So he says, So I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns. And on its heads, a blasphemous name. Now, who is this beast? Well, I think you probably understand who this beast is. And, uh, of course, what we see is that it says he's rising up out of the sea. And, of course, what we associate with the sea is that it's talking about the Gentiles. So this beast will rise up out of the Gentile nations. Well, we see also it says it has seven heads, meaning that it has great rulership. It rules a great part of this world. It says also has ten horns. And ten, of course, means complete. So it has complete power. And it also says it has ten crowns. So you can see how this, this beast has authority. And, of course, it has a blasphemous name. And, of course, remember the blasphemy means to injure the name of God. Well, how could it be possible to injure God's name? Well, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But as you can see, what John, what John is doing is appealing back to Daniel chapter 7, in which our class on Wednesday night is going to get to this week. And we're going to talk about the four beasts that rose up out of the sea. 
And look what Daniel says in verse 2. Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. And what we're, we're going to see is that, if you remember in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of this big statue that was made out of different materials. One, his head of gold, chest and arms of silver, of bronze, and of iron and clay. Well, this same vision of chapter 2 corresponds to chapter 7. And we're going to see that it corresponds to those four kingdoms that rose and fell. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And so as you can see, these four great beasts arose up out of the sea. And it represented, of course, in Daniel 7, a lion, a bear, a leopard, and of course it just says a great beast. And so you don't really know what it looked like. But to see, to show you what this this beast had a blasphemous name. You remember in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus was uh, basically talking to the Jews and they came up to him and wanted to trip him up. And uh, they said, who who shall we pay tax or who who shall we uh, rule pay, pay taxes to? Should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Because they're trying to press him into a dilemma. They're trying to make him either go against Rome and thus be a revolutionary, or to not fall taxes and make the people angry. So what did Jesus do? Well, Jesus did it exactly right as he always does. He said, "Show me a denarius." And this is a picture of that denarius of the image of Tiberius, Tiberius Caesar, who was reigning during that time. Now, as you can see, it's written in Latin, but it says under in that second line, "Tis Caesar Div Avg Augustus." So basically, to Caesar Divine Augustus. So what is uh, what was Tiberius making himself out to be? He was making himself out to be a god. And this is that same denarius that Jesus was showing to the people. He said, render to Caesars the things that are Caesars, and render to God the things that are God's. And so, of course, sadly what we see here is the case that there is emperors who claim to be gods. And, of course, what does Satan want us to do? He wants us to be our own god. He wants us to rule our own lives. He doesn't want God to rule our lives, but he wants to rule us, though. And we must be ready, be sober, be vigilant. For the adversary of the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Maybe watch out for Satan. As Colossians 1 verse 13 will talk about, we're to let God rule in our lives because he has translated out of, out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the dear son of his love. But going on, it says in verse 2, Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a, of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. Well, as you can recognize, each of these have some characteristic that is involved with the beast. Of course, uh, as we recognize with a leopard, it's quick on its feet, so it's very swift, very fast. We see with regards to a bear, it's very strong and mighty. And of course, with the lion, it's known for its royalty. And so this all summarizes this, this beast that we're talking about. And of course, that has to refer to the Roman Empire That's at that time. That is persecuting the Christians under the rule of Nero Caesar. And of course, we see that the Roman Empire did, look how vast it was. Look how rich it was. I mean, this is vast, the vastness of this empire was very strong and mighty. Well, that's what we read about. It says that the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And if you know anything about the life of the history of Nero, he was, and, and most of these Roman rulers, they were evil, wicked people, people that we would not want to be around. And so it says that I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. Well, what is this referring to? It's referring to two, either one or two things. It can be very referring to that there was this myth going around after Nero had committed suicide that there were those who saw him resurrect. They thought, oh, he was wounded for a time and he was resurrected. And they thought that they saw him later. So kind of John is using this, so to speak, to show a description of who this sea beast is. But I'm more likely to incline that it's referring to the second 
option and that it's referring to how it was under Julius Caesar. Julius wanted to change the Rome from the Roman Senate into what was known as the Roman Empire. And of course, you'll remember what occurred was that Julius Caesar was assassinated, but so he was it was wounded for a time, but then it re resurrected back into becoming an empire under Augustus and Tiberius and for so forth. So I'm more inclined to show you that the description of the sea beast is referring to this Roman Empire. Well, it also says that all the world marveled and followed the beast. There are people, as the, as the gospel accounts say, remember when Jesus was being put on trial, what would they say to Pilate? They said, we have no king but Caesar. They didn't want God to rule in their lives. So you can see how it is the case in some sense that Israel, sat, old Israel, was following the beast in some sense, and that they were willing to follow him instead of God. Well, of course, you remember that the Roman Empire, when it says that people marvel at it, of course, they can marvel at very different things. They can marvel because of the entertainment that Roman provi the Romans provided, such as the gladiatorial games where there was killing going on and bloodshed all over in the Colosseum. You can also notice that they were also noted for their economy and how they paved all these Roman roads and had all this trade going on to make it a very prosperous nation. And then, of course, notice that also it's known for its power and wealth and that, sadly, many people will put their trust in a nation. But should you put your trust in a nation or put your trust in the living and true God? That's what we were going to see. We also need to recognize that we need to put our trust only in God for he is the only one worthy of being trustworthy. As Proverbs 14, 34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And right now in our country, we're having a great decline. And we need to re really watch out whether or not are we trusting in our own nation or trusting in God. Well, it says, So they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? I'll tell you who is able to make war with the beast, and that is God. He will fight against the beast. But see, we've been reading from Psalm 9, verses 8 through 10, where the Bible says, He shall judge the world in righteousness, and he shall minister judgment for the peoples in uprightness. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble, and those who know your name will put their trust in you, for you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. We should think about that it is great for a nation who seeks God, but woe to that nation who does not seek the Lord. As Psalm 9 verse 17 says, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Is our nation forgetting God? Certainly it is. And so we need to be thinking about are we going to put our trust in God or not? Who are you putting your trust in? And when we think about all the nations that have come in the earth's history, where are they now? And you think about God, who is everlasting to everlasting. Shall we not put our trust in Him? Because He is always reliable. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 through 5 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We need to recognize that we need the gospel to be carried out throughout this nation and all the whole world to solve the problem of sin. Because that's what we need to recognize is that we need to become stronger in knowing God's word and how to approach people with God's word and try to help them to obey what God has said. Well, Revelation 13, verse 5, goes on to say this, And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. So as you can recognize, the Roman emperors claimed to be God for many, many years. All of them, claim, uh, in some sense, claimed to be God. So they were speaking blasphemies, in, again, as the beast would. Then it says that they would continue for 42 months. Well, we've run into this number of 42 months, and we recognize that it must uh, be referenced to 
the three and a half years in which there was a siege against Jerusalem. Well, who came against Jerusalem? The Roman Empire did. It came against Jerusalem. And so we see how Rome was destroying the city of Jerusalem for three and a half years. Well, it says, Then he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. That's very interesting that the name of God is being blasphemed among the Roman Empire because, well, of course, they herald many of their emperors as gods instead of listening to the true and living God. And then, of course, it says that they blasphemed his tabernacle. Well, what is the true tabernacle now? And those who dwell in heaven, who dwells in God's presence, so to speak? It's the church. The church is being blasphemed by the Roman Empire. They are being called a sect that's being spoken everywhere against. They're being called a sect of the Nazarenes. So you can see how it is the case that the church is being persecuted, how they were injuring the church. And, of course, remember, the sense in that the church dwelt in heaven is because, as Ephesians 1, verse 3 says, all spiritual blessings are found in the heavenly places in Christ. So if we're in Christ, we're, in a sense, in the heavenly places. We have access to the spiritual blessings. And so that's why it says... It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And so as we've been journeying through the book of Acts, you see that it's not just the Jews who are attacking the church, but we're going to see in AD 60s where the church is being persecuted in Asia Minor. And so it's being persecuted heavily. And so we need to recognize where these persecutions are, go are coming from. And then it says, All those who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now this is a very interesting statement that talks about how did it, is it possible that they worship the beast? And that was what's going to lead us to what's called the land beast which stands for emperor worship. Many places across the empire introduced emperor worship where they built statues to the Roman emperors and they would have these, this priesthood in which you had to burn incense as a token of your allegiance to the Roman Empire. Well, of course, many Christians recognize that that would be offering idolatry. They can only worship the true and living God. So to do that would, be, would compromise their faith. So they rebel against that. They would not go along with that. And that was right for them to do because we is better to obey God than men. And so we see how it is the case that that's why they were persecuted. Well, we see that there's an application here. That those who worship the beast are those who are not written in the book of life. Now, it, this could be applied to those who worship anything besides God. They are not in the book of life or their name will be blotted out of the book of life it may be the case that we become christians but and our name is written in the book of life but it may be the case that we sadly become unfaithful to god and god will blot out his name from our name from the book of life so we need to ask ourselves are we in god's book of remembrance are we are we really can we really sing that song my name is in the book of life oh bless the name of jesus we need to recognize that Revelation 3 verse 5 says, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. But it's to those who overcome and who continue to be cleansed and are in white garments. And of course, those who have the blood of Christ applied to their lives, who have obeyed the gospel. Have you obeyed the gospel? Because if you obey the gospel, your name can be written in the book of life. Well, it goes on to say, If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. There are going to be those who are in Jer the city of Jerusalem who are going to fight against the Roman Empire. Many of them are going to go into captivity. They're going to be captured by the Romans. But the Christians, you remember, what did they, what did they do? They escaped. So they're not, going to be cap they're not going to be captured, nor will they be killed with the sword because they escaped the city of Jerusalem. And so they have patience 
and the faith. What great faith they did have and what great faith and patience we must continue to endure as we go through this life so we can press on to the goal of eternal life. Well, that's where we go on to verse 11 where it says, Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. And, of course, what did this earth have? What did this uh, land beast have? It says, very interesting enough, had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Remember how Jesus, he often gave some great illustrations, and this is one of the ones that he gave in Matthew 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets, for who will come to you in sheep's clothing, but who are in ravenous wolves. Of course, we've seen where in cartoons where there was a wolf who had on sheep's clothing. Well, what is the picture here? Well, it says that there was one who's dressed up like a lamb, but yet it spoke like a dragon. It's very deceptive. That's what false teachers are able to do, is to, is to deceive us easily if we don't watch out, if we don't study our Bibles. And that's what we see false prophets trying to do even today, who will teach false doctrine. We must be on our guard. And so we must watch out because we can sadly be in a spiritual slumber. And as the Bible says, awake to righteousness. We need to always be awakened lest we sleep in a spiritual slumber. Well, it says, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Well, of course, no doubt, of course, is referring to emperor worship because it was the priesthood of the emperor's worship who gave, of course, allegiance to the Roman Empire. And so they got many people across the Roman Empire to serve the serve the Roman Empire. Well, it says he performs great signs so that even he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth and the sight of men. There are those who will perform pseudo miracles to somehow give credence to their religion. There are people today who try to say that they perform miracles, but of course they're not true genuine miracles as recorded in the New Testament to sadly deceive people and to get to make a following. Well, that's, of course, what they were doing in emperor worship. They claimed to have some kind of divine calling and stance. And, of course, they weren't able to perform genuine miracles. And it says, He deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Well, as you can see, it says that they were making an image. Well... That means to sadly go into idolatry. Those who worship by emperor worship are giving into idolatry. And that's sad that that takes place. It says he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, and that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Well, and that was exactly what was happening to those Christians who would not worship the emperor. They would lay down their lives for Jesus Christ. And it says, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. In history, what this is a reference to is that if you offered incense to the emperor, the priest would actually give you some kind of token or some kind of mark which would enable you to buy from the marketplace or even to sell at the marketplace, showing that you had made an offering to the emperor. Well, of course, you remember that many Christians would refuse to do that, so they didn't receive the, this mark, and therefore they would not be able to buy or sell. And sadly, that would lead them to starve to death. So you can see the endurance, the faithfulness of these early saints. But then we come to that last verse where it says in verse 18, Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For is the number of a man, his number is 666. Of course, you all know there have been movies made all about this number. <laughs> there have been millions of books sold on this, on this, by this number. You know, what's really interesting is that when you look in the early manuscripts, you find this number 666, but also you actually have the word 616. And the reason for that is because of this. And I want to show you what these, what the, basically what they would, would do is that they would 
make this number, uh, since this was written in Greek, of course, you remember that this was written to Jews who understood the Old Testament. So they could translate those Greek alphabetic letters into Hebrew letters. And you remember that Hebrew letters can stand for a number. So the early Christians would know who this number of the beast, the number of a man was. And, of course, they said it was Nero Caesar that this could be in reference to. Now, I told you there was also a 616 well, that could mean actually in Latin, and that could refer to Nero Caesar. So what they would do is basically they were trying to make sure that the Romans did not understand what was being written down. That's why this was written down in this type of language, to show that the enemies of God will be destroyed and that the faithfulness of the saints is definitely worth it. If you're a Christian and you're living the Christian life, it is certainly worth it. And so what's really interesting is that there's also a second application of this, and that is remember that the number seven in Hebrew means perfect. So to fall short of that would be the number six. So think about that, six, six, six. So to make that three, that would basically mean that this person is a counterfeit of divinity. And that's what Nero did. He claimed to be a god, but of course he really wasn't a god. He was a counterfeit. And so the Christians need to recognize who's the true and living God. It's the God, of course, who came to this earth and who suffered and died on the cross. And that is Jesus Christ. And so we can see what this mark of the beast is. And there's some great applications for us today. And that the Bible says, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So the question I have for us, is the seal of God imprinted on our lives, or in a sense, do we have the mark of the world on us? Are we identifying ourselves with the world, or are we identifying ourselves with Jesus Christ and his church? It's one or the other, but those who depart, who have the imprint of God in their lives, are those who let iniquity go away from them. Let him who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So the question is, do we have sin in our lives? If we have sin in our lives, we, don't have, we are not showing that God owns us and that we're having him rule our lives. And so we need to recognize, am I willing to let sin be pushed away to be washed and cleansed from my life? Because that's why God came to save us from our sins, because sin leads to hell. God wants to save us from hell. And don't you, don't you want to be saved from hell? That's why God came to save us from. And so if you're willing to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be immersed in water, you can be owned by God. God will put His seal upon you. Or maybe it's a case that, are you going to let the world keep on having its way with you? And sadly, the world is passing away in the lust thereof. And sadly... Meaning the people will world will perish into hell fire. But you have a choice to obey. Will you obey God or will you obey the devil? It's up to us. Make that choice. Will you obey God? I urge you to do that today. Or again, we stand and sing the invitation song. <laughs>